من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله First I would like to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the source of all praise, the source of all good for allowing us to unite in one of his houses in the same way he allowed us and gave us permission to, uh, to unite in, uh, in his house is for us to also unite in Al-Fardaus Al-A'la, Allahumma Ameen, as Allah is the most generous. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive and elevate the ranks of those who had anything to do with establishing and putting this event together. And for those who actually struggled in the snow and put on their four by fours and their four times four to get here throughout the snow. Uh, so may Allah reward you. I mean, it takes a lot of guts and courage to leave your home. I'm not going to lie. If I were not if I were not on the schedule to speak, I probably would have stayed home tonight, right? That, that's just me though. So you guys have a lot more courage than me. And of course, for our sisters who came out uh, to this lecture, that's not fun. I don't find pleasure. I just want just a few disclosures, inshallah ta'ala. Um, I don't take pleasure, nor do I find pleasure in tackling these subjects. But I feel with what's going on out there in the world, uh, the way things are drifting and the way things are changing, uh, people have to start speaking up people have to start speaking up because things are definitely drifting in the wrong direction. Um, so what am I here to speak about? Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam through the lens of the Quran and Sunnah, through the, the balance, if you will, right? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the most balanced human being. And when you study his Sunnah, when you study his Seerah, you find that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I think what's very, very near and dear to my heart, is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, irrespective of what he did or how he did it, at the end of the day, yes, he receives revelation, yes, he's Sayyidu Waladi Adam, he's the best of mankind, but what, what means more to me is that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a human being. As he mentioned to his wife, Um Salama, he says, Ya Um Salama, inni innama ana bashar. Indeed, Um Salama, I'm a human being. I'm content like other people are content and I get angry the same way other people get angry. So there's that common denominator between us and our beloved Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the sense that there are certain things that he did that we would also probably do. Why? Because he's a human being. He's infallible in the sense of committing major mistakes and minor mistakes, but he's not infallible in terms of making mistakes. So he would make uh, he would make mistakes, but he would not sin. So there's, there's a farq there. I think that's what separates us, right? He's infallible in terms of making uh, the sins, but he's not infallible in terms of making mistakes, right? From those who don't intend to cherry pick. It's just becoming popular. It's becoming conventional. People want to hear it and people want to take it. And that, I would argue, is, um, and of course, this is within intra-Muslim dialogue. And I find this to be very, very unhealthy for the average Muslim sister, especially our sisters who are in college, who are being bombarded left, right, and center by postmodernist professors, by atheist professors, by uh, cynical theory professors, and uh, especially on college campuses where our sisters, what's, they're being bombarded with a lot of these affirmations, right? Toxic masculinity on one hand, male chauvinism on the other. Men are, are just abusers. The root of all evil are men. You don't need a man to validate you. You can do it on your own. I mean, nowhere, no way in the world can us, I mean, if you were to tell me, I, that does not affect me, I would say it's as if you're telling me you're an angel now and no longer a human being. How can you go through that stench day in and day out? And that's all you're hearing, but to come later and say, oh no, that doesn't hurt me at all, alhamdulillah, that doesn't affect me at all. You're a human being. You're a human being. It has to affect you in one way or another. So um, when you hear this, it's toxic and dangerous for the women, for the women, right? But it's also toxic, toxic for a lot of our men. Why? Because men feed off of that energy. A lot of you who are in... Um, <clears throat> A lot of you who are in, uh, uh, on campus or even in high school in the MSA, I'm noticing that not, not many of you here, all right? Maybe I would say many in another place or a setting, but let's say some of you are trying your utmost and you're so desperately trying to seek approval from the sisters that if I were to tell you in the corner, do you agree with her? You'd probably say, no, Sheikh, but you know what? I just brought brownie points with the sisters. So the problem is, I'm gonna give you all some advice quickly. You can get by with that in high school. You can get by with that in college, but I'm gonna tell you, you not being your authentic self or feeling comfortable to be your authentic self when you're married, you're not gonna last. 
You being afraid of being your authentic self in marriage, it's going to hurt your marriage and it's going to literally stop and crumble before it even begins. Okay, so I just want to let you know, if that's you, if you find yourself always pandering to the sisters, even if it's clear haram, and the sisters, they always cheer you on, Brother Abdullah, he's always on our side, mashallah. It sounds good, but guess what? She's not going to come looking for you in marriage, bro. These sisters, when they get married, they're not looking for you. By the way, where was that guy who always agreed with us, with us the yes brother? They're not looking for the yes brother. I'm telling you, they're not looking for the yes brother, right? And maybe during the Q&A, inshallah ta'ala, we can talk about this, okay? When I see what's happening online, do you know what, the, what I think of almost immediately? I think of the verse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, in Surah Al-Baqarah, where he says, أَفَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِبَعْضِ الْكِتَابِ وَتَكْفُرُونَ بِبَعْضِ Do you believe in some of the revelation or the book and do you neglect a part of it? Now, no genuine Muslim will agree by raise of hands and say, yeah, hey, I'm actually that Muslim. I believe in some and reject other parts. La. But it, it, its manifestation becomes clear that we're cherry picking. And I'll give you three topics, I think, that stand out you. If you're online, this is something that if you didn't notice, you should have noticed, right? One has to do with the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The social media pages today, and this is going to be somewhat of a lengthy introduction, forgive me. Um, what's happening on social media pages almost every day, if not every other day, you're going to find some da'i, some prominent speakers, some prominent page talking to you, making you feel comfortable, making you feel bubbly. Even if you're making poor choices, they're reminding you that whatever you do, Allah is going to forgive you. Don't, don't despair of the mercy of Allah. Now, do I have a problem with that? Am I saying I'm, I'm an exception and I don't need the mercy of Allah? No, but it's not healthy when this is all you're seeing. Why? Because when this is all you see, this is all you hear at the khutbah, this is all you hear when you go to that national convention, this is all you hear when you go on campus, this is all you hear when you're listening to a main speaker, that is not healthy for you. In fact, that could literally validate what you're doing. Because for some Muslims, what works for you, Abdullah or Gulad, doesn't work for you, O Warsami. Okay? What, and what works for Warsami doesn't work for Gulad. Gulad, every time he's hearing about the mercy of Allah, do you know what he feels? He feels like he's going out with old girl tonight and he's gonna spit game. Right? Because why? He's always hearing, Allah's the most gracious, most merciful. Allah's more merciful to you than your own mother. He's hearing this time in and time out. What, the, what is that gonna do to him? That's literally gonna be somewhat of an incentive for this person to perpetuate in his haram. Right? And, and I came across this from a da'i whose name I will omit for the sake of, of the audience here. He mentioned the hadith al Qudusi where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, إِذَا أَحَبَّ اللَّهُ عَبْدًا نَادَ جِبْرِيلِ فَقَالَ يَا جِبْرِيلِ إِنِّي أُحِبُّ فُلَانِ فَأَحِبُّوهُ فَيُنَاجِ جِبْرِيلِ فِي السَّمَاءِ فَيَقُولُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ فُلَانِ فَأَحِبُّوهُ the Qudusi hadith says that if Allah loves a person, He brings Jibreel forth and He will say, Oh Jibreel, I love this person, so love him. Jibreel will call in the heavens and say, Allah loves so and so. So you also love him to speak into the other angels. The hadith doesn't stop there. The hadith continues. There's a second part of the hadith that some of us need to listen and need to hear. Perhaps this is what I'm looking for to shape me up and make me a better Muslim and for me to kind of remove myself from that stagnation and just kind of sit in there idle. Yeah, I'm a Muslim. Yeah, we need you to keep start moving though, right? Not the whole baby steps, right? And, and this is the corny, the corny baby steps to Jannah. When it comes to the dunya, right? We're rushing, we're do your best, do your all, never settle for less. But when it comes to Jannah, baby steps, brother. This is, no, it's supposed to be the other way around. Or, or rush in both, right? A lot of these cringy, corny things that we Muslims fall for. Oh, mashallah, and this might, well, mashallah, what? That's cringy. Allah says, sabiqu sari'u, right? Okay, now going back to this, the second part of the hadith, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, but if I despise or hate a person, I call Jibreel and I say, oh Jibreel, I despise slash hate this person, so you despise him and call in the heavens for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to despise that person. You as a Muslim, when you get, this per you get this portion, you get this portion, you get the complete picture of the hadith, you're like, man, I wish I'm one of those that Allah loves. And then when you hear the second portion, you're thinking, oh, I hope I'm not one of those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala despises. What if Allah despises me because of what I posted this morning? What if Allah despises me because of what I did with old girl last night? What if Allah is despising me because of what I intend on doing tonight, right? Feeling good all the time is not good. Being patted on the back all the time is not good. And, and to be honest, 
This is what's, the dawa in America revolves around that. You're doing great. You're doing an amazing job. What if I'm not? What if I'm not doing an amazing job? What if I need someone to shake me up, to wake me up? Right? Are, we, is, are you telling me? We, no, we do need that. Right? So one is, has to do with the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by the way, I, when, see I'm active online. The only reason why I'm active online is not because I don't have a life or I'm a bum. I have nothing to do. I have a, a beautiful wife, an honorable wife who I will do anything for. May Allah reward her. I mean, and I have three kids that I need, to, I need time for, right? However, you find Muslims, it's as if they're Christians. Brother, this is haram. Brother, I have a very good heart. Alhamdulillah, I don't hurt anybody. That kind of sounds like Christianity. But you know where this is coming from? Laysa an farag. This is not just one. It, it's coming from these repeated affirmations. Allah is going to forgive you. Allah is going to forgive you. Allah is going to... This is all they hear. All they hear, they feel good. We want people, we want you to feel guilty when you're doing wrong. We want you to feel a sense of shame when you're doing wrong. That is healthy because that's going to be the catalyst or the mechanism to move you forward and release you from that stagnation or relieve you from where you were. We don't want you feeling good and being defiant at the same time. When you're defiant, when you're disobeying Allah, we want you to feel bad about that. So that's why a lot of Muslims are starting to literally sound like Christians online. Oh brother, as long as I have a good heart. Yeah, but you still have to wear hijab. You still have to pray, right? Number two is the Prophet's character. The Prophet's character وسلم, is literally being carved and singled out as this pushover. Now if you were to ask a da'i or an imam or a Muslim public speaker, do you believe the Prophet وسلم, was a weak pushover? Do you believe he was weak? Do you believe he was not a courageous man? They won't say yes. <coughs> but what do I hear as a young Muslim man in America how likely is it that I'm going to hear about the Prophet's boldness? How likely is it you're going to hear about his courage? How likely is it that you're going to hear about his audacity? How likely is it that you're going to learn about how firm he was when it came to the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? No, what you're going to hear though is how he forgave the man who urinated in the masjid. That's what you're most likely going to hear. And I'm willing to put money on it. Just, it's a figure of speech. Right? You're going to hear how the man came and grabbed him by his garment and the Prophet said, Zidhu ya Umar. This is what we're used to hearing, right? And this is not healthy for you as a young upcoming male living in 2020 in a society that's literally predicated on the emasculation of men. That's not healthy for you. Why? Because now you start mixing things up. What do I mean by that? You start literally taking it in, you're being embarrassed, you're being ridiculed and mocked, and you think the prophetic way to all of this is to smile. You believe that that's the prophetic way. It's not. Do you know why? Because the Prophet ﷺ, yes, he did indeed forgive the man who was against the, uh, urinating in the masjid. He did. But do you guys know why he forgave him and he didn't badger him or he didn't do anything, didn't seek any alternative? Because the man was an Arabi, he was from a nomad, a distant place, right? And he did not know better. Now why is it that when Al-As ibn Wa'il came to him and he grabbed a piece of bone and he did like this to him? يَزْعُمُ رَبُّكَ أَنَّهُ يُحْيِي هَذِهِ اللَّهُ بَعْدَ أَنْ كَانَتْ رَمِيمًا Your Lord is claiming that he's going to bring this back to life after it being just dust. Do you know what he said? Do you guys think he said, what an amazing question. This is really a sign and an indication of your great intellect. No, 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 no. The prophet that you're not hearing enough about said to him, yes, he's going to revive it and then put you into hell. So we have Prophet Muhammad who condemned a man to hell in his face. Now, does that take away from his message? Does that take away from him being the, the Sayyid Walid the Adam? No, it doesn't. The point here is that Prophet Muhammad, there's a place and time for everything. We're being taught, many of you unfortunately, by well-intentioned speakers, you're being taught that to be a pushover and to just smile at every given moment, that's the prophetic way. No, it's not. It's not the prophetic way, okay? Number three, and especially here when we're talking about being emasculated, number three is Prophet Muhammad the husband. Prophet Muhammad, the husband. All you will hear, and again, when you go into a masjid, you go to an MSA, an organization, you go into one of these lectures, what you're usually going to hear is how the Prophet Sallallahu was listening to Aisha when she was yelling at him. Or Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu when the servant came with the plate, Aisha got jealous, she hit the plate, it fell on the floor, 
the bowl broke and the Prophet said simply gharat ummukum. The Prophet ﷺ, how he took Aisha and she was looking at those who were playing with the Hiraba, because, you know, the Abyssinians, they were playing. And he took her and he said, oh Aisha, more? And do I as a Muslim, do I have a problem with that? No, not at all. Am I saying that the Prophet should not have done that? No. The problem is you, the average Muslim, when you hear about this, this is all you're hearing about when you come to Khutbah al Jumu'ah. So we're depicting Prophet Muhammad وسلم, By the way, I, I don't want to say Muslim feminists. I just feel like those don't really mesh together, honestly. Uh, and if you're asking why, maybe we can go through it in the uh, Q and A, inshallah ta'ala. Um, why I would prefer saying a Muslim who identifies as a feminist, right? I don't feel comfortable saying a Muslim feminist. I'm just going to say a Muslim who says or calls herself a feminist, right? Is that the Prophet وسلم, He's portrayed as this yes man. I want to tell you all something. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was far from being a yes man. And if you want your marriage to succeed, don't be a jerk, don't be a tyrant, don't be rude and selfish, but you, you should not also think about being a yes man. Okay? Now, this is, this is literally what you see, right? And that's why, for example, today, this is all you hear on campuses. You don't need a mat to validate you. If you're going to marry her, marry her and admire her from afar. Right. What, whatever that means, right? You're either going to add to her whatever she's got going on or just admire her from afar. I want, I got news for all of you here. The Prophet Sallallahu was not a man who sat and saw his wives do whatever it is they did. Not that they even engaged in any haram, right? Which brings me, which brings me to my next point. And that is that, how many of you are on WhatsApp? By raise of hands, by the way. Okay, everybody, everybody and their mama, mashallah. Okay, may Allah bless your mothers. What's funny is, I received literally in the last month or two, give or take, I received two sisters at national conventions. Do you know what they're talking about? They're talking about how the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was the best to his wives. Again, do I, have, do I have any qualms with that? Should you have any qualms with that? No, not at all. Now, these, these conventions have been going on for about maybe 10, 15 years, give or take. Don't, don't, don't hold me accountable. Have you guys ever been to one of these conventions and heard a sister or even a brother speaking with the same fervor, with the same zeal, with the same compassion about how to honor and yes, obey your husband? Raise of hands. Why? Why? Do you think that our women today are so amazing to their husbands that they don't have to hear that. Oh no, they're, no, no. The wives of the messenger, they had to hear that. But our women today are doing so amazing and so marvelous that no, they're an exception. No, there's nothing special about us. There's nothing special about us at all. Nothing. So here's what's happening. The sister, when she goes to the masjid, when she goes to the national convention, when she's at the MSA, when things are popping and you know, everything is going off the hook, what does she hear? The Prophet ﷺ said, I'm the best of you. The best of you are those who are the best to their wives, and I'm the best of you to his wives. Okay, very good. Again, do I have a problem with that? Not at all. Not at all. Okay. There are some women who don't need to be hearing that. Do you know why? Because she's already dishonoring her husband. She's already not giving her husband's rights. She's already being a wretched woman or a wretched wife. The last thing she needs to hear is, Oh, the best of you who are the... And she turns to her husband, he's like, I'm doing everything already. What are you talking about? He's already doing everything, right? The same way not everybody needs to hear about the mercy of Allah. Why? Some people need to hear about the wrath of Allah so they can wake up a bit. Do you guys see where I'm going with this? There are some women that need to hear that, hey, you not honoring your husband comes with grave consequences in your akhirah if you do intend on being married. Okay? And this is, I think this is very, very... Very, very problematic, right? There's a saying that says, your partner brings out the best in you, or they can bring out the worst in you. You guys know this, right? The Prophet ﷺ, do you guys know how easy it was for him to say that? Like, when you're married to a woman who's dishonoring you, who's stepping over you, who's, I don't want to say emasculating you, because you should, I mean, that's like saying, Sheikh, my wife's pushing me around, what do I do? Well, I'm not going to tell you what to do, you need to figure it out yourself. You should not tell another man, my wife is pushing me around. No. You don't tell a man that. You got to figure it out yourself. No, I'm not going to offer you any solutions. There's a problem if, you're, if that's what's really happening in your house. That's a problem, right? So the Prophet ﷺ, it's easy for him. But I find it 
oversimplistic for a woman to come today who doesn't respect her husband, who doesn't honor her husband, who's talking about her husband, who doesn't listen to her husband, who basically, him being around or not around is the same. He says, hey, she's like, whatever, please. You're not gonna tell me what to do. You're not gonna tell me what to dress. Who are you? You're not my dad. Who are you to judge? And the list goes on and on, right? The Prophet ﷺ did not have to do with any of this. So the Prophet ﷺ can easily say that he was the best to his wives. Why? Because they brought out the best in him. And he brought out the best in them. I find it overly simplistic for a woman to come today. Oh, look at how the Prophet cheated his wives. How are you cheated? How, okay, how did his wives treat him? Because there, there's always two sides, right? It takes two to tango. There's always two sides to the story. It's easy to say that the messenger was the greatest man to his wives, but I got a question for you. How were his wives to him? He was an honorable man. She, they were honorable women, but I find it easily, too easy, right? You get off the hook too easily when you're not being an honorable person yourself, and then you say, oh, but the prophet was the best to his wives. You're bringing out the best in this man. But then you're trying to compare your situation to the situation of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Okay, now I'm going to move on to the first point that I want. That was just an intro, by the way. Forgive me. Uh, can I get a bottle of water, please? See, I always thought that the Somali community was generous. <laughs> <laughs> I went over. The, I went over this uh, brother's house one time, and I, he was like, "Come and talk to my daughter. She's planning on leaving Islam." I was like, "Oh, stuff a lot." This and the idea. I was there talking for like two hours. I literally had to ask him for water. He was like, "I wanted to wait until you're done." I was like, "Right." <laughs> Seriously. Um, I'll tell you, the first thing that I want to talk about is the concept of ghayra, the concept of ghayra or jealousy, right? What our young men are being taught today is that if you're jealous, if you're jealous, if you have a kind of ghayra, you're either viewed as being insecure or you have this huge inferiority complex that you have to go see a psychotherapist for. Now you as a young man, young men today, they're afraid of being their, themselves. You're afraid of expressing yourself. You're even afraid... You're even afraid of telling your wife how you really feel, right? Now, I'm not going to go into anecdotal evidence. This brother got married. His wife wasn't giving him his rights. He found himself on, on the internet doing haram. And yeah, why? Because he was afraid of being his authentic self. He's afraid of his wife thinking, you're a pervert. Is that all you think about? Right? This is what we hear. So the Prophet in terms of his jealousy, in terms of his jealousy, he was a jealous man. It was healthy jealousy though. And I think the word jealousy doesn't really give the meaning in itself because it's a protective jealousy. It doesn't mean that you're insecure. And like any trait, jealousy can have its bounds. You can go to one extreme or you can be extremely jealous or you can go to the other front and not really worry about it at all. Thank you. So the Prophet ﷺ, one of the stories that I want to mention, one of the stories that I want to mention is the Prophet ﷺ, he walked in on the house of Umm Salama radiallahu anha. When he walked in on Umm Salama, there was a muhannath there with, along with her brother. He was an effeminate man. So the Prophet وسلم, after he heard his speech, he looked at Umm Salama, he says, لا يدخلن عليكم هذا. I do not want this man in my house again. Period. Okay? So you, you as a man, in your house, if you know it's someone who's not a good companion, someone who comes and your wife is one way, and the minute she leaves, she's a, compl she's a volcano, you probably should not want that woman in your house again. Islamically speaking, that is your right. That's your right. Nothing controversial about it. Right? So the Prophet said him after he heard his speech, he said, I do not want this man in my house again. Why? Out of his jealousy. Another one, Aisha radiallahu anha, she says, one day I was sitting, the Prophet walked in, as soon as he saw me, he got She said, as soon as the Prophet walked in and saw me, his face got red and his color on his face completely changed. Why? Because she was there with another person, another man. But when the Prophet later found out, when the Prophet later found out, it was Akhuha min al It was her brother from Sakhalin. In other words, they had the same woman naam, as a murdi'a. The point of the story here is the Prophet wasallam. he got angry. His face changed. Today, if you were to do that, or if you were to just get angry, <gasps> oh, toxic masculinity, this is literally, I, I'm serious, this is literally what you're going to get. Am I exaggerating or is this true? It's true. It's true. It's true. It's true. It's true. 
Huh? Oh, you're mansplaining, brother. We got to take you to a psychotherapist. This, I'm telling you, you guys, see, this sounds funny, but this is, I'm telling you, it's getting out of control. And, and I don't want to get too carried away, okay? I made, I made a promise that I'm going to stay stable tonight and not get too swayed away. The Prophet ﷺ, there was a man sitting, and he says, إِيَّاكُمْ وَالدُّخُولَ عَلَى nisa." Be aware, do not go in to the places where there are women. When he says, Ya Rasulullah, what about al hamu What about the brother-in-law? The Prophet ﷺ says, the brother-in-law is death. Death meaning here the prohibition. And I want to I wanna open up another bracket here. Your brother, when you're married to a sister, your brother is not a mahram. Your, when you leave the house, your brother should not be coming to your house to sit there and chat with your wife. They shouldn't be friends on Facebook. Your wife shouldn't be giggling with him. And that is your right. That's called healthy masculinity, Islamically. That's not called having an inferiority complex. All right? The Prophet ﷺ says the brother-in-law is death. He's death. I heard recently a brother talk about that. The in-law, sometimes the sister will go out and they'll go out shopping together for her brother. Now, does this, does this mean that you don't trust him? Does this mean you don't trust the... No. I don't trust the shaitan that's with them. This is who I don't trust. Right? So the Prophet ﷺ talked about the hamu, his death. Don't take these things lightly. Another narration that I want to share with you talking about jealousy. Umar ibn al-Khattab, the Prophet ﷺ, when in his Rihlat uh, al-Isra' wal miraj he saw a big castle. And he saw a woman with a basin next to it. So the Prophet ﷺ asked Jibreel, لِمَنْ هَذَا الْقَصْرِ Who's this qasr for? He says, this is the qasr of Umar radiallahu anhu. He said, this is the qasr of Umar. The Prophet وسلم, he says, تَذَكَّرْتُ غَيْرَتَكْ he says, I remembered, oh Umar, he's telling Umar later on, oh Umar, I remembered your jealousy. I remembered your jealousy. So I looked away and I didn't even want to go in the castle to see how it looked, right? So the Prophet ﷺ, is he rebuking Umar for being jealous? Or is he praising him and commending him for being jealous? He's praising him. He's praising him, right? In another story, and I'll end with this, even though this is not about the Prophet ﷺ, but it has to do with the ghayr of Zubayr radiallahu anhu, because I think it's important. A lot of you young men need to hear about this. You need to hear about this. The Prophet ﷺ, one day he was with his companions, right? And he sees Asma radiallahu anha. Asma was doing chores for her husband, by the way. So as soon as the Prophet sees her, وسلم, he brings the camel down for her, and he asks her to ride, he'll give her a ride. Asma, may Allah be pleased with her, she says, As soon as the Prophet approached me and offered me a ride on the camel, I remembered immediately my husband's jealousy, so I stopped. Do you think a marriage like this is going to last? Yeah. I'd say so. You know what? I'm not really worried about him because he's exaggerating anyways and he always takes things out of proportion. Oh, messenger of Allah, all right. No. Now notice here, the Prophet said, is there anybody, is there anyone on the face of the earth with a, a heart more pure than the heart of the Prophet Wasallam? No. Does the Prophet tell her, oh, Asma, don't worry about it. Your husband is Zubayr. He usually exaggerates in these matters. Does he do that? Does he say, oh, Asma, I'm not going to do nothing to you. I'm not the boogeyman because we hear this from our aunts and uncles, right? When it's your wife and you're feeling a bit like, I don't want her going with her cousin. I don't care who he is. No. And they, your auntie looks at you, you're exaggerating. And he's not going to bite her. He's not the boogeyman. He's not the monster. And you're like, no, I don't want that for my wife. I don't care who he is. Right? So the thing is, the Prophet doesn't even say that you're exaggerating. He doesn't say, hold on, Asma, are you doubting my intention? Are you, are you thinking bad of me? No. She, when she speaks like that and honors her husband in such a way, the Prophet wasallam, he respects her decision. He doesn't try to convince her otherwise. And he sees it. He doesn't even ask her why. In the hadith, he sees it. As soon as she says that, the Prophet wasallam, picks the ba'it and he continues with his companions. Right? So do not allow somebody to come and tell you that, oh, you're jealous and you're exaggerating and so on and so forth. Yes. By the way, when we're speaking of jealousy, can it become an inferiority complex? Yes. When I hear a brother, for example, someone who says, Oh, I'm so jealous for my wife. He says, I'm so jealous for my wife that even when she sees her brother, I don't allow him to give her a kiss. For me, I think that's a little bit exaggerated. 
right? That's a little bit exaggerated, okay? Maybe I'll end with this as well, Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, because I think this is important, the concept of jealousy or this point. Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, right? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was talking about ayat al-tahrim in Surah al-Nur. The Prophet alayhi salam, he said that you have to have four witnesses. Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, when he heard that, he couldn't, he couldn't take it. He said, what? If I see another man with my wife, I have to go bring four witnesses and look for four witnesses? He says, Wallahi, if I were to see a man with my wife, I would have struck him and not paid any attention to it. The Prophet ﷺ, he says, min Are you all amazed or surprised concerning the jealousy of Sa'ad ibn Ubadah? He didn't say you don't have the right to feel that way. He said, are you all surprised? No, you shouldn't be surprised. He says, I am more jealous. I am more jealous than Sa'ad. And Allah is more jealous than myself. How many of you are hearing this for the first time? You shouldn't. You shouldn't. And my son raises his hands, right? <laughs> you heard this more than once, Habibi. Um, number five is the jealousy of his wives, right? Women get jealous, men also get jealous, right? One of the instances that I want to share with you, and then I kind of want to compare the two so you can, guys can, guys can kind of get a better, better idea as to how the Prophet Wasallam in this scenario, he dealt with his wife this way, but in this scenario, he dealt with his wife in a completely different way, right? So the Prophet Wasallam had his friends, right, invited over. Someone knocks on the door, and it was the turn of Aisha radiallahu anha. So someone knocks at the door. Aisha radiallahu anha, she opens up. It's a young, it's a young boy, it's a servant with, with a bowl, with food in it, right, with food. As soon as Aisha sees that, because it's her turn, it's her night, right? In other words, don't step on my toes. This is not your night, right? Stay away, stay alive, right? Like those trucks they say, on the back of the snow, stay away, stay alive, right? It's one of those, right? So as soon as she sees that, she grabs her hand like this and she slams the bowl, inevitably causing it to break, and it created a, a big scene. The Prophet wasallam, he reaches to the ground, out of his great noble character, وسلم, he reaches the food, he compiles a lot all together, and then he commands, he tells Aisha, he says, oh Aisha, please go prepare another bowl, يعني العين بالعين, right, that restitution, you have to kind of pay back. So she brings the bowl and she gives it back to him, to the servant, and he goes uh, on his happy way. The Prophet وسلم, the only thing he says is, غارت أمكم. He looked at his friends, and he said, eat what's left, your mother got a little bit jealous. Speaking about Aisha, right? Right? Okay. Now, does this mean, is this an open door or a green light for a woman to do that when the husband has guests over? No. The moral of the story is not that. The Prophet ﷺ, why he didn't do nothing is because he understood how her jealousy got the best of her and he didn't want to make another scene. In other words, what happened, that's enough. Now, when we move to another story, you're going to see a different prophet. It doesn't mean that he was schizophrenic, وسلم, and it doesn't mean that he was bipolar either. No. It's just there's a time and place for everything. One night, he walked in and Aisha radiallahu anha, she says herself, she says, shall I not tell you about a story that happened between I and the Messenger وسلم. She's speaking with the other women, the mothers of the believers. She said, one night I was laying in bed and the Prophet وسلم, walks in. He walks in literally tippy-toeing, right? He doesn't want to wake his wife up. Right? So if you're married, you don't just turn on the lights and turn on the fan and what are you doing? You're sleeping for me. Stop, right? He says he's tippy toes. He puts his uh, sandals literally in his armpit right here. He puts them on the floor. Then he tippy toes into bed. And then as he's going to sleep, he wakes up again. He makes sure that she's asleep. And he literally sneaks out of the house. Why? He did not want to wake her up. She got jealous. She follows the Prophet وسلم, later on. You know, it's one of those where you pick, when you're kind of, <laughs> right? One of those. So the Prophet وسلم, he went to Maqbarat al baqia where his companions were, being, were buried. As soon as he got there, he's lifting his hands up like this and making dua for the companions who were martyred, right? The Prophet وسلم, upon turning like this, he sees like this shape in black. So he starts to kind of walk a little bit fast. Aisha says, so I start walking a little bit fast. So the Prophet ﷺ starts kind of jogging. She says, so I started to jog. And then the Prophet ﷺ, she sees the Prophet ﷺ running. So she starts to run. And so Aisha radiallahu anha, she says, فَسَبَقْتُهُ right? I got there way before him. And she gets in bed. Now Aisha radiallahu anha is running. So you're inhaling, exhaling, inhaling, exhaling, right? So you're like... 
he left her sleep though, didn't he? So he gets in bed and he says, Aisha, why are you breathing like this? What's going on? So he's kind of putting two and two together, right? So when he does it, he says, Aisha, why are you breathing like this, right? She said, oh, nothing, nothing. She didn't give him the answer immediately. She said, nothing, nothing. He said, you're, you're either going to tell me or else Allah will tell me via revelation. Right? <laughs> so, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You're either going to tell me or I'm going to get revelation. It's either or, right? So she's kind of like, she's, she doesn't know what to do now, right? So, anha. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then he says, were you the one, were you the black, were you the, the, the black shape that was, was that you? She says, yes, Rasulullah, yes, it was me. Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, فَلَا هَدَنِي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ لَهَدَةً أَوْجَعَتْنِي She says that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم shoved me like this and it caused me minor pain. Toxic masculinity, calm down with all this. Please, keep your cards in your pocket. Perhaps burn them and shred them. Belay, please. Listen, the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, he's a human being. He got frustrated. He was angry. In other words, you're... Why did Aisha, Aisha was, by the way, maybe I got too far. Aisha was afraid that the Prophet was going to go to one of his other wives. So that's why she got out, literally tippy and trying to see where he's going to end up, right? So the Prophet he was a human being. He got angry out of frustration. Lahda, by the way, because people use it against the Prophet. Lahda is not barb. Lahda in Arabic is dun al darb. Because Aisha radiallahu anha in one narration she says, لا ما ضرب رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم بيده قط لمرأة ولا خادمة إلا أن يجاهد في سبيل الله أو أن تنتهك حرمة من حرمة الله. She says no by Allah the Prophet صلى never hit anything not a human being or not a servant with his hands only that he fought in battle صلى الله عليه وسلم. So it's not a hit per se. It's a it's a لهدا. In other words, wake up. You should not think this of me, right? Now I got a question for all of you. Why is it that the Prophet وسلم, when the broke, when the bowl broke and shattered, all he said was, Gharat ummukum. But here, here, he gave her like a little shove in the chest. And she, by her own acknowledgement, she says that it, it hurt me, it caused me a little bit pain. Why? Because he hurt her feelings more than anything, right? Huh? He hurt her feelings more than anything, right? That's because it's just them. Thank you. It's them too, it's private. <laughs> now, some of you might think that I was going to say, and the Prophet السلام, he gave her a kiss on the head and he says, Afiya tagharin ya Aisha. This is, this is I, I want you guys, it's not that we're looking to portray the Prophet in a, a negative way. This is in the seerah, this is not like some shad hadith. This is all in the kutub, it's all there. I want you guys, especially getting married, especially, especially for our sisters, you're going to have moments like this. You're gonna have, you know, there's gonna be discord, there's gonna be disunity, there's gonna be disagreement. I, you going in with this, the, the, the aura that's permeating every facet in, on college campus, you bring in that image, all that uh, energy into your marriage, you're not gonna do well. You will not fare well at all. Right? So the Prophet does this take away from him being the best of mankind? Not at all. It just shows that he is a human being. It shows that he was a human being. And I think, I, I, I believe, not I think, your wife's going to be jealous. Your husband's going to be jealous. Jealousy is normal. Your wife comes to you and says, I don't want you talking with that girl. I think you guys took it a little bit too far. What do you say? Oh, worry about yourself? Honey, I'm sorry. You're right. I saw you from there, you're at the cashier, I think you were joking a little bit too around with, you know, too much with, with so and so. Is it your job to say, oh, you're insecure, would you just go? No. There are certain things in marriage that you're not going to be able to understand, but you're going to have to come to terms with. There are certain things in marriage that you're not going to fully understand. A woman about a man and a man about a woman, but you're going to have to accept it. Don't try to understand it, because now you're going too far. You're seeking that which has no explanation. Women will never fully understand a man, and men will never fully understand women. This is how Allah created us. Not in everything. There are going to be those mis mysteries out there that you're not meant to understand fully. You're not made to understand it, right? And by the way, for you brothers out there, you being married and having your wife dazzled online, 
I'm just telling you, I fear that you end up in those where the Prophet ﷺ, when he says, One of the manifestations of the day youth, the Prophet says that he will not enter into paradise, is a man who doesn't have this protective jealousy for his wife. Now your wife has a profession, she's a doctor, she's a chemist, she's an attorney. She doesn't have to be dazzled up, she gets dazzled up for you. The dazzling up and all that makeup and all the, the alta, all that, she's supposed to do that for you and for you only, not for the world. Is this nonsensical? No, this is Islam. This is Islam. And that's your right. And, and, and if she tries to compare you as a fitna to her, it's not the same. It's not the same. And again, save your questions because I'm sure some people are just riling on fire now. Oh, I cannot believe he went there. I did. And I wish you were with me, right? How did the Prophet ﷺ deal with Munkar? How did he... And by the way, my sarcasm, I mean it in, in, in good spirits, right? Maybe I feel this comfortable because uh, we're like family. Right? <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> so so de dealing with Munkar, right? How the Prophet ﷺ dealt with Munkar? First off, was there any munkar in his household to begin with? What munkar are we talking about? The movies? The rated R movies? The Netflix? What, are we what haram are we talking about? The magazines of half-naked women from, from you know, glor gl uh, pff, Gloria Secrets. <laughs> what is she called? Victoria. I would have been there. I don't even want to mention her name, right? Magazines laying all over the place. We're, that never existed. The Prophet wasallam, he walked in one day. And Aisha again says, As soon as he saw me, his face changed. She said the Prophet ﷺ walked in and he saw a curtain, literally, just like this curtain right here, right here, and it had animals, right? Pictures of animals drawn on it. She said the Prophet ﷺ went to the sitar and he tore it in half and he says, Ya Aisha, Amma ta'alameen, anna ashadda nasi adhaban yawm al qiyamat al musawwirun. Oh, Aisha, are you not aware that the worst people in the sight of Allah in terms of punishment are those who draw, draw animals or they make pictures and so on and so forth. We're not going to go into the khilaf al-fiqhi. But the Prophet ﷺ, first his face got red. He got angry. Is this healthy angry? Or it's non-warranted angry? It's healthy angry. It's legitimate angry. Anger, forgive me. It's not the anger that all of you hear. Oh, the Prophet said, La taghdab, la taghdab, la taghdab. That anger has to do with petty things in life, right? Like for example, you go to the coffee shop and they end up putting salt in instead of sugar. You don't say, you stupid idiots, you guys always ruin my, you ruin my day, man. That's petty anger. This is where the Prophet says, La taghdab. Don't be angry. Or it's anger, it's anger that's going to get you in trouble and the consequences are going to haunt you for the rest of your life. That's the anger that the Prophet is talking about. However, here the Prophet is talking about what? It's rightful ang anger. You as the man of the house, you see something that's haram in your house, it is your, your right. It is your right to go and take that down and say, no, this, is not, this does not please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't have to be a monster about it. You don't have to be, right? Now, I want you to assume if the Prophet ﷺ walked into his house and Netflix is going on with half-naked women on there because it's just a movie, it's rated R, right? Or magazines or what? How do you think the Prophet would react? Huh? You get the sword and destroy it. See, now you guys are getting violent. Now you guys are stuck for Allah. So, so on, on a serious note, right? On a serious note. Was Aisha aware of the tahrim? Was she aware that that was haram? Ajibu Yanas. Was Aisha aware that that was haram? Did he tell her, did I not tell you, oh Aisha, that you're not supposed to do this? Didn't we have this con Did he do that? What about a woman, who, a man who's married with a woman? She doesn't pray. She doesn't want to wear hijab. She has a problem with hijab. She has a problem with just a man being a man. She has a problem. She doesn't want to wake up for fajr. She's watching things that the husband does not approve of. That's haram. She's supposed to be lowering her gaze. And the list goes on and on, right? How is he supposed to react? No, I, what I'm saying here, sometimes we share some of these ahadith, but we don't give it its context. We oversimplify the whole ordeal. If the Prophet ﷺ walked into one of our houses today, I don't know what he would start with. The basement, the first floor, the clock, I don't know what he would start with. We have a lot of munkar in our own homes, right? Yes. It doesn't mean that you're controversial as a man. You're the man of the house. 
That is your response to what? Oh, okay. I got three more points, inshallah ta'ala, and then we're going to cut it short. I think people are getting hungry. Okay. One thing also that I would like to cover, inshallah ta'ala, is the Prophet sallallahu distanced himself from his wives for a consecutive 29 days. Why? They kept on begging him for money. Give us money. Give it, and they colluded together against the Prophet ﷺ because they wanted more nafaqa, more expenditure, right? The Prophet ﷺ, Umar ibn al-Khattab, when he walked into, it's called the mashraba, he said, I looked around and there are literally two or three things. It was a little room. It was literally like a little room or a little closet, if you, what have you. And that's where he stayed for 29 days and he did not engage with his wives. Why? Ta'deeban lahunna. Ta'deeban, literally, يعني, inter, it, it, it was a form of discipline for his wives. He did not see them, right, or, or engage with them for 29 days. Umar ibn Khattab, he got so angry, he said, did you divorce your wives? He says, no, but I decided to stay away from them for 29 days. So the Prophet was not a yes man. He was not a pushover. But he also wasn't a selfish, disrespectful person either. He was doing what the average, normal, sane man would do in his house. Okay? Uh, two, two more things, inshallah ta'ala. Did his wives talk back to him? Right? Because these are the things that, oh, of course. Right? Women empowerment, right? Listen. The Prophet sallallahu Abu Bakr was walking by. One day he walks in. And Abu Bakr hears his own daughter, his own daughter, Asma, talking to the Prophet sallallahu and being loud with him, right? So Abu Bakr, he grabs her and he says, Ala araki tarfa'ina sawtaki ala rasulillah. Do you not, what's wrong with you? I, I, I see that your, uh, your voice is rising and you're being loud. And you're speaking loud, right? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he gets in between Aisha and her father. And he says, no, 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 please. Just leave her alone. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam looks at her and he said, do you see what I did? Do you see how I prevented you from that man? Right? He's trying to be funny, right? Okay. I got a question for you. Some women, they look at this hadith and they, 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 they want to be rude and disrespectful and talk back to their husbands, not once in a blue moon. It's like an everyday occurrence. And then she comes to you and she says, I know, but Abu Bakr, you know that story of Aisha where she basically was talking back to the Prophet and I was like, yeah, but I, I want to assure you that was not an everyday, everyday occurrence. No. And you guys, I think I'm going to drag Umar radiallahu anhu in here real quickly as well. You guys know about the story of the man who came knocking at Umar radiallahu anhu? And he heard his wife being loud to Umar radiallahu anhu. And then when Umar opened up the door, he said, what is it you want? He said, I came to complain to you about something that is in my household. So never mind. Do you know what Umar ibn Khattab said? By the way, this, this qissa, this qissa is mawdu'a. This qissa is, has no asl. It has no narration. However, let's assume, let's assume for, for being sensitive here, meeting you halfway, that it's a true legitimate story, right? Do you know what Umar radiallahu anhu says? He says, how, why will I not put up with her? She cleans my clothes. She cooks for me. She feeds my children. And she keeps me from committing haram. Some women today, they, they want to do none of that. But they want to come to you and say, but look at how the wife of Umar was talking to him. I mean, look, if you were doing half of the stuff she was doing, I don't think your husband would have a problem with you. But for you, cooking is like a curse. Cleaning is like, you know, uh, uh, blasphemy. Uh, taking care of the kids is like, I mean, it's, I mean, is it really fair to use the scenario or the situation of Umar radiallahu anhu? So I think we go overboard in terms of oversimplifying a lot of these things, right? So anyways, one thing I want to ask. Does the wife of Umar have any doubt that the man of that house is Umar? Does she have any doubt that the man of that house is Umar? No, no, no. So for him, it's just like, oh, she's having her day. It's not, not a big deal. It's different than your man. He's, he's like a cat. He, he, he's emasculated. He's beyond emasculated, right? And the same thing with the Prophet. The Prophet Wasallam knows, well, she's having one of those days. But to think that this was an everyday occurrence, you got it, we got it all wrong. Okay, I think this is one of the last things, inshallah. Can I, please? Can I? Okay, okay, all right, okay. Um, in terms of the food, right? This is the other curse, and this is why I kind of want to speak about this right after this. Is some people, they, they're, they're, they're very sensitive to this idea of cooking for their husband, right? It's like, oh no, who am I to cook for him, right? The Prophet وسلم, with his wife Aisha, we have almost all, every minute detail of how the Prophet وسلم, dealt with his wives. 
But we do not have one narration, even fabricated narration, I'm sure, well, no, no, I ran into a fabricated uh, 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 tweet, a fabricated um, uh, feminist uh, narration, right? Uh, from a feminist literally four months ago on Twitter, and she said, oh, the prophet did cook his own food. I'm still waiting for the narration. I'm still, you remember that? I'm still waiting. She ended up deleting it, by the way. See, this is what happens when you go overboard, you're desperate to appease everybody else. Oh, our prophet used to cook. No, he did not cook. I got news for you. There's no narration that says the prophet said him cook. Stop. Does that make you less of a man to cook in your home? No. No. But in a certain dynamic where if the mother's a stay-at-home mother, and you're out there on the grind from 6, 7 o'clock in the morning until 5 o'clock at night. Is that unreasonable to find a, a, a nice home cooked meal, gourmet meal at home? Is that asking for too much? No. Some of them, I've turned this whole thing into like this, the World War III. I, seriously, who am I to cook for him? Right? So we have to really, the Prophet in Hadith Abu Dawood, when he walked in as well, he says, Ya Aisha, at'imina, at'imina. Oh, Aisha, feed us, feed us. She fed them. And then he says, Isqina, Isqina, Ya Aisha. Also nurture us or give us, you know, uh, laban. And, and so the Prophet, in one narration, he walked into the house. He says, Ya Aisha, hal min ta'am? Oh, Aisha, is there any food? He said, No. She said, No. What did he say? He said, Inni sa'im. But today, when you, see, you know, when you see those memes, those cheesy memes, oh, it's sunnah to. Look, your Prophet, did not say, you know what, Aisha? Grab the tomatoes, I'm gonna to grab the onions. Grab the marmorita, we're gonna sit there, right? And we're gonna do this together. The Prophet never did that. He never did that. It doesn't mean that you can, look, if you can cook, you wanna cook, kudos to you. It should not make you less of a man. I just wanna emphasize that it does not make you less of a man. But we have to, see, we get really desperate out there. We start to, Oh, the Prophet said, take care of women, and he was crying. No, he said, take care of women, but he was not crying. Stop it. Stop the, it's enough. People are convinced that Islam tells us to care, take care of women. You don't have to um, appeal to people's emotions. And he was also crying and tearing. No, he was not crying, and he was not tearing up. Stop it. I have two more points. If you want me to stop, then... Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like on the real though, like this time I really mean it. I'm going to run through this quickly. Two more points inshallah ta'ala, quickly. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when the munafiqeen accused her of doing something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala later on proved her innocence, right? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this lasted for about a month. Aisha radiallahu anha, she herself narrates, she said, the most difficult thing for me was when I got sick, I did not find that care and compassion from the Prophet that I would get on any other day. Does this mean that the Prophet ﷺ said, and I was debating bringing this up, but I want to bring up just to show you that getting married doesn't mean that your husband is going to be this crazy roller coaster ride and it's all going to be smooth. No, you, you have to be ready for hiccups and you have to be okay with criticism. Okay, even if you got a PhD somewhere, that doesn't mean you're above criticism. The, the, the haq still applies to you, right? So, she says that was the most difficult thing on me. The Prophet ﷺ, it doesn't mean that he thought that she did it. It doesn't mean that he was doubting her innocence, no. But he was hurt. People in the community are talking about your wife, he was hurt. It, it's hard to remain focused during those times, it really is. And that's why in the narration he says, Ya Aisha, in kunti al-mamti bi dhanbin fastaghfirillah. Oh, Aisha, if you did something that wasn't right, just ask Allah for forgiveness. But the point I want to draw all of your attention to is that when he would walk in, Aisha would say, يَدْخُلُ عَلَيْنَ وَيَقُولُ كَيْفَ تِيكُمْ Even his address and his wife changed. He would say, not Aish, like he usually would. He would say, كَيْفَ تِيكُمْ How is this girl? And by the way, all, that, all those memes and posts that you see about Husnul that's not healthy. All the stuff that you see out there, like this one guy, he said, if you see beer on someone's beard, if you see beer on someone's beard, then assume someone spit it on him. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Don't, don't, deal, don't bother asking. We go overboard when it comes to Hasnul Dhan. Overboard when it comes to this concept of Hasnul Dhan, right? So much so that people now, they're defiant online, they're disobeying Allah in public, and they think like, your job as a Muslim, is to find 70 excuses for me. 
Do you see what happens? Do you see how people translate these things? That's the problem. So Aisha radiallahu anha, she would say that the Prophet ﷺ would come in, we say, Kayfatikum. Right? Kayfatikum. Last point, inshallah ta'ala, right? That I, I want to mention is this. When it comes to intimacy, this is important. The Prophet says, أَيُّ مُمْرَأَةٍ دَعَاهَا زَوْجُهَا إِلَىٰ فِرَاشِهَا فَأَبَتْ عَلَيْهِ بَيْنَ قَوْسَيْنْ بِغَيْرِ عُذْرٍ شَرْعِ إِلَّا وَبَاتَتْ وَالْمَلَائِكَةُ تَلْعَنُهَا There's not a woman whose husband he calls and she doesn't answer the call, only that the angels would be that night cursing her. Okay? No, there's no such thing about, and if the woman calls the husband, no. Because the majority of the time, the husband literally does not even have to be called. Why? Because we're biologically different. The Prophet ﷺ emphasizes on the woman because it's the man who's usually seeking this kind of attention from the woman and not the other way around. That's why الحكم بالأعم الأغلب The rule is by the general. Right? You might have certain exceptions. Alright? Do you know, if, I were to, if you were to ask me what's the most complaint that I get? The chief complaint I get from men when they call me, Sheikh, my wife is not giving me my rights. You know the first thing that comes to mind, and I'm going to get a little bit... Um, uh, you guys remember that movie back in like the time you say Usa, right? Like you can get overboard, you say Usa. You know what, what gets me? As soon as I hear a man telling me this, the first thing I think of is I think of SubhanAllah. The women in the workplace, wearing the tight jeans, the cleavage, the makeup, the perfume. I mean, you look this way, astaghfirullah. You look this way, like astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah again, right? Everywhere you look, right? Especially if he has like an office job and this is all he's seeing. How is it that the woman, if, how is it that the woman is looking at him Oh, why are you as a woman be, I mean, well, I, honestly, this is beyond me. Because if he commits zina, if he's watching, I don't want to say the word, online, do you know who gets part of that blame? Who? Who? Wife. The wife. Without khilaf. We're not talking about certain circumstances where the woman, she's sick, she's on her monthly, there are exceptions. But this idea of, you know, playing him down and treating him like a little boy or treating his knees like frivolous, that's dangerous. And that's not going to get you far in marriage. And that's why, you remember earlier when I said some of you brothers are playing like a good image on college campuses? I'm telling you right now, you either get it together and be your authentic self and let her know what it is and what it's not. Because if you're going to walk into marriage, Thinking that you got all this game and, and you're, not, you're, not, you're not built enough where you're ready to just be your authentic self, it's going to really cause a lot of damage in your marriage. Right? And like I said, it's really beyond me how a woman, if the man came home from work and he didn't engage in that, you should be surprised. Like, out of all that fitna and what's going on with you? Like, you should be surprised that he's not asking for that. And I know some of you are saying, well, why don't men just lower their gaze? Men are doing that. The Prophet ﷺ walked out of his home, and I'm gonna, this is it. The Prophet ﷺ walked out of his house. As soon as he walked out, it was his wife Zainab. As soon as he walked out, he came back to his wife Zainab. He saw her literally busy in, she was busying herself with the tent. She was doing some work. He obviously told her, right? The Prophet ﷺ, when he leaves, she, she gave him his rights, right? For lack of a better term. It's not the place here to be too explicit, of course. When he was walking out, he says, there's not a man that sees a woman only that he should go back to his wife because that is going to repel what he finds in his heart. Now, are you going to now tell me that the prophet wasn't lower in his gaze? Because it's as if I hear this here. Oh, why didn't he just lower his gaze? Right? I mean, I hope a Muslim doesn't say that, but I mean, it's the, the, the stench is like, the, 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 not the aroma. I wish it was aroma, right? The odor is getting so far, and everybody's smelling it, it's bad, right? Listen, I know I get carried away. I know I get a bit sarcastic sometimes, and I'm, I'm working on it. I've, I've come a long way. However, my message for all of you here is, do not allow, do not allow the approach or the way keep you from benefiting from what you heard, or from taking in what you've heard. I don't know. Um, uh, Sheikh Uthman, do we have a, a quick time uh, for Q&A? Oh. We're going to do two Okay, so, all right. Anyway, Zakim Allah for being such a gracious audience and for being uh, such attentive listeners. Uh, and if I hurt you, uh, it wasn't my intention. But perhaps maybe you're too soft. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
No. And if you guys have any questions, though, you guys can ask me, and I'll Google the answer for you. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Just. Uh, oh, okay. Sorry. So, does that come off? Uh, may Allah reward our Sheikh, uh, yeah. Sheikh Susi. I know he's a, he has a very unique way of delivering the message, and you know which which um, a lot of people are um, uh, attracted by, and maybe some people not. But oh, a lot! I turned off, bro. Alhamdulillah, um, we hope that Allah, we we want to accept all the things that he said that was happening from Allah. Inshallah. Amen. Amen. And then all the things that he said that went overboard. And we ask Allah to forgive him and forgive us. I mean, um, uh, I mean. So, um, just, I want to start with the sisters. I'm going to give the, the, the four and the, uh, uh, the sisters first. We have two questions that came in. I have on text um, for, from the sister side, inshallah. So the first question for you is, do you see women's jealousy less than a man's or less serious? Is this the no, no, not not at all. And I, I don't think I was saying that, but I think we're I mean I mean the Quran, the Sunnah definitely showed that men are jealous and women are, are jealous and it's it's degrees by women and it's degrees also by men. Uh, I, I I mean I cited that on, on intentionally to show how Sa'd ibn Ubadah he just mentioned just how he stressed to the Prophet ﷺ just how jealous he was as, as, as a man. And Aisha radiallahu anha, she was jealous on many occasions, right? When she threw, broke the bowl, but also when she followed him out to Maqbarat al-Baqiyah. So the Prophet ﷺ, he, his wife got jealous, men get jealous, women get jealous. I, my point tonight is to say that being jealous is part of, it's, it's healthy. So long as it's not carried away and so long as you don't go to extremes with it, it's healthy. My, my qualms here is that we're being taught, a lot of our young men are being taught today that just the, the feeling, just sensing that jealousy, it means you're either insecure or that you have a self in, an inferiority complex. And this is what I don't want you guys to buy into. Not, but no, not, not at all. You have some women, they're more jealous than men. And some men are more jealous than women. There, there's nothing that backs up one of, one of the two. No. Oh, do I? Uh, the next question is, what do you think about men who use their Islamic rights to abuse their wives? That's tricky because if you're using your Islamic rights, you, you should not abuse. You, that's kind of tricky. I'm, maybe they can elaborate a little bit more. Um, but th if there's something that I would like to say, see, when I hear the word abuse, the word abuse is loose. The word abuse is a very loose word. Like some women today, and I'm going to be very honest, they've ab absorbed so much of the progressive, liberal talking points, especially when it comes to feminism. That's male chauvinism, you're mansplaining. And I'm telling you, a lot of them have been severely damaged by this nonsense that now anything that comes their way that doesn't align itself with what they've already ab absorbed, they think it's oh, this is a form of abuse, oh, this is abuse. Like your husband telling you how to dress, that's not abuse, that's Islam. Because on Judgment Day, he's going to be asked about you on Judgment Day. You leave in the house with perfume, and him telling you that's not appropriate, please come in and take it off or change, that's not abuse. Your husband telling you that he doesn't want your pictures and you m mingling around with you know, different guys online, and you don't want your picture of your wife online for any random Jeff, Harry or Tom to see, that's not abuse. So what I'm afraid of is, if we're talking about legitimate, you know, legitimate abuse here, then of course, I mean, I'm not gonna sit on his side and you know, pat his back and say, well, because you're a man, I agree with you. A'udhu billah, no. I mean, I have a wife, I have a daughter. I don't want nobody abusing her, right? But we, I think when, when you see the word abuse, you're taken back. But what does it mean? What does abuse mean? What context are we using it in, right? No. <laughs> um, let's say, for example, I, I, I'll probably, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be, um, I'll, I'll be on the sister side today and help with it, inshallah, with that question. Let's say, for example, in terms of intimacy, um, the husband, uh, he doesn't allow his wife any breaks. 
and he continues to keep asking and nudging her, and then he will say, well, you know, the angels will curse you. Sure, like that. sure. Yeah, see, if we're talking about something like this, and it's too much on the woman, and it becomes a little bit, you know, excessive, becomes a little bit excessive, you have to be considerate of your wife. You have to be considerate, of course, and either, this all requires a bit of elaborating, right? You have to be considerate of your wife. You have to be considerate whether if she's working the following day or not, what your schedule is, the dynamics of that home, how, how are things you know, running about. Um, but if, if it's really too much, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها, right? وعاشرهن بالمعروف, and treat them with respect. استوصوا بالنساء خيرا, right? Um, Right? So the Prophet tells us that we have to be, yes, we have to be soft, we have to be nurturing, we have to be loving with our wives. No one is questioning that. So you as a man as well, you have to be considerate. You have to be understanding. Maybe you are asking for too much. Maybe, maybe what's adding to that excessiveness is perhaps maybe you're not lowering your gaze outside. I, I don't want to say who, but this happens in the community where the man is wandering eyes all over the place. Well, that's not going to help curb your appetite, right? So you have to do, I think, we as men as well, we have to take it upon ourselves, because that's my new motto in 2022. Make accountability great again. Literally, that's like my motto for Dawa in 2022. Make accountability great again, right? Some of us men, maybe we have to kind of look ourselves in the mirror and kind of, you know, okay, well, maybe I'm being a little bit excessive. Maybe this is too much. You have to consider her. You have to consider her well-being. I mean, so, and of course... One situation, there are a million and one situations out there that you're going to say, this doesn't apply to me. Oh, this doesn't apply to me. Oh, this doesn't apply to me, right? So, I mean, there are general guidelines that we all have to be considerate of. But when it comes to intimacy, the woman has to take it serious. And the man also has to take his wife seriously as well. When it comes to intimacy, downplaying that, especially in the time of fitna right now. SubhanAllah, Umar ibn Khad, uh, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, do you know what he said? He says, لو لم يبقى من أجلي إلا عشرة أيام ولي طول النكاح فيهن لا تزوجت مخافة الفتنة. He said, by Allah, if I only had ten days in my life remaining, and I knew, I knew I would die in, after those ten days, and I had the ability, the financial ability to get married, I would have gotten married out of the fear of falling into zina. Who is this saying this? Um, uh, Abdullah bin Mas'ud saying it when? saying it during the purest of communities, right? And perhaps counseling is an option as well, right? And, and I didn't say it earlier, forgive me, that counseling is never a viable solution. I never said it's not a viable alternative. La, but not any little thing, ha, huh, oh, you have to go see the psychiatrist because I, I smell toxic masculinity, right? No, no, I, no, no. <laughs> Um, we actually have a lot of uh, questions pouring in from the sister side. Um, Sheikh, uh, some of them, I think, are not even questions, they're just some like, full statements. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's good. We'd love to hear uh, for feedback from our audience, and definitely, uh, especially in this regard, a lot of the topic does pertain more to the sisters and the sister brothers. So um, I'm going to just read this. It says, I am planning to get married. But, um, but the person here is saying that do, um, but when do try, my parents deny, okay, due to my pride, I think she's saying, my parents deny me to get married and I am lost on what to do. And this is the fourth time he is doing this and my whole family agrees with him. I think it's the father here. Um, the man I want to marry is Muslim and prays. So I guess that has to advice it as a Muslim woman. Yeah, I, I, I mean, this is a common one where the sister wants to marry a brother or the brother wants to marry the sister and it's not of their tribe. I, I, can't, re I, don't, I can't relate to that. Unfortunately, I can't relate to that, which is not to say I don't have advice, but I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the hope is within you, the younger generation, to really, really wean yourselves from this tribal loyalty that, that some people are holding on to too much, literally, and they're fighting tooth and nail for. Our hope is in the younger generation to move beyond that, yani, so we can transcend this, this false loyalty when it comes to tribalism, right? Now, as for the sister, the Prophet clearly says, 
Dina huwa khuluqahu. Subhanallah. And this is beautiful because the Prophet ﷺ says, if a man comes to you and he has good character and he's religious, notice how he separates the two. He doesn't say with good character or just religious. He says a man who is religious but also has good character, marry him because if you do not do that, mischief will spread in the land, right? Zina, fahisha, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> yani, this sister obviously getting married, you want your parents' approval. You, 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 you know, you want your parents' approval. But if there's not a legitimate reason in the person is kuf, if the person is truly kuf, technically you can get married with that person. Islamically speaking, if, the, if, if they're kuf, if they're truly compatible, if they are as she says they are, then she can get married by the Qadi or Man Yanubu Anil Qadi. In this case, it would be an Imam of a Masjid. Now, and again, I can't relate to the, the particularities of tribalism because I'm not of that background. And, and it, this might sound good in theory, but I don't know in terms of practicality how will it all unfold. But generally speaking, Yani, let me share a story with you. Or maybe you can relate this to your father. The sister wanted to get, I was in Ohio once. <clears throat> the sister wanted to get married to a man, but the father kept on objecting. The sister went away, got, she didn't get married. She went away, committed zina, and she ended up being pregnant. Now, I want any father listening to me right now. What's going to bring shame to you more? Your daughter marrying from a tribe you don't approve of, or your daughter, right, having children outside of wedlock? I'm t right, and another thing too, another thing too, Sometimes your parents, are, they don't approve of the man or the woman. This is not the typical me, but I'm going to say this. Sometimes you have to stick. Sometimes you have to have thick skin. And sometimes you have to stick your grounds. Mom, you're not marrying her. I'm marrying her. You're not going to live with her. I'm going to live with her. You're my mother until, from today until, until the, 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 the end of the world. However, you don't agree. I want to let you know I'm marrying her. A lot of women, a lot of mothers, gave in like that. When they saw, and that's your rujula. This is where your manliness comes in. Because your wife, here's the thing. <clears throat> Halal game, inshallah. Your wife, when she sees you going back to your mother on every little thing, she's going to lose total respect for you. And guess what? I will too. Yeah, I talked with my mom and um, she said, you're not the right one for me. You're not ready for marriage, bro. Real talk. You're not ready for marriage. Or every little breakout or fallout or disagreement that happens between you and your wife, you're on the phone with your mom. Mom, um, yeah, she didn't cook for me today. What? Some men are out there. I, see, I'm the one who gets these calls, not you. I'm the one who gets these calls, right? So, and, and I know some, they were adamant. She said, you're only going to marry her from our country, our country. He stuck in there for a year or two. She finally gave in and said, he's not going to budge. We'll just get him married, right? So sometimes it's not about, it's not easy, right? It's like being stuck between a rock and a hard place. It's not that you want to go against your parents. You want your parents' blessings. But sometimes you, it means you sticking in there, right? And I ask Allah to make it easy for you. Wallahi, I can't believe parents do this, these things. I, may Allah guide them. Wallahi, it's, it, it, yeah. That hurts my heart. Sheikh, <laughs> is uh, you, did, you did understand our community correctly? Tribes is a tricky thing. So the next uh, statement, or this is a statement, I'm going to read to the sister. Uh, she seems kind of upset here. So she says she can email me. She can. She email. Can, you can email him too as well. But no. But if you feel it's appropriate to read out loud, then go ahead. Okay. I think because she sent it, so I think she okay. No, no worries. Okay. So she said we mentioned a question: why, why we do not discuss men's rights and obedience from their wives? I can only speak from my culture. <laughs> For the most part, our parents are traditional. Uh, she put in parentheses: they do everything for their husbands and complete their rights as much as possible. Which I do not think is wrong, but being raised in those type of environments, we are constantly taught men's rights, not ours. From a young age, I knew what was expected of me, but the energy is not reciprocated. Brothers are transgressing, but there is a lack of constant blame on women. There is a lack of responsibility on the brother's side on being good husbands. They are not fulfilling their duties and creating this movement 
of men are trash. You heavily focus on what women are doing wrong as Sheikh always do. I mean, as she always do. But I hope we have another lecture that focuses on how our brothers can be responsible. You should have been to the first part. You'll see on YouTube, inshallah, but it's fine. Um, I, I just want to thank the sister for being decent and civil. And I don't say that sarcastically. Because um, I know a lot of this information is very hard to swallow and it's very hard to take in, especially you're not used to hearing it. You're, here's, here's, here's why Yusuf Susi is not focused on that. Okay? Why I focused on this tonight? Because it's the norm. It's the norm today, right? To talk about women's rights. Women's rights. Love her, respect her, honor her. And we don't have a problem with that. But unfortunately, men, young men today are lost. And that's why. Yeah, exactly. I think she proved it. That a lot of young men, this trash, men are trash movement or whatever it is. I wouldn't say, it's, yes, it's part and parcel because some men are still young boys. They're not ready for marriage. They're not responsible. They're not accountable. But it's also due, let's be honest here, meet me halfway. It's because of third wave feminism. Let's be honest. That energy is really, really toxic. I can do it without a man. I don't need a man in my life. I'm an educated woman. This is the co chief complaint. And I, I'm not dodging the question here. This is the chief complaint. My wife keeps telling me I'm an educated woman. I can do it on my own. I don't need you here. Men want to feel appreciated. Women want to feel appreciated as well. But we men, we're not going out saying, you know what? We don't need women. We can do it on our own. We're lying. No one can do it on their own. Men can't do it on their own, and guess what? Women can't do it on their own either. So for the women who are truly in this city, and again, listen, when I talk about something, there's going to be a scenario that's not gonna apply to you. You're like, he's not speaking to me. That's quite possible, that's quite possible. It bothers me to the bones when I hear about women being upright, being loving, nurturing, and caring to their husbands, and the husbands are selfish, they're greedy, they're disrespectful. They're at the cafe shops four or five hours a day. And it's the woman who has to do everything and anything. I personally resent men like this. If you see your father as being this man, you have to pick up your pants and know that you don't want to perpetuate. Because yes, that is toxic. It bothers me to the bones. And there are some men, honestly, the last thing they need to hear is women have to obey their husbands. Why? Because she's already doing that and much more. But he's unfortunately, he's a jerk. He's self-centered. It's all about him. And when his wife asks for something, oh, she's just a woman. You know how women are. Literally treating his woman, his wife, as one of his daughters. So I, I am not, I'm not gender biased here. But the reason why I wanted to focus on this is because all we hear out there today is how to be good to the woman, how to honor the woman, how to massage her feet, how to give her this. How to, and again, I don't have a problem with that. But men, men are today, they're taught that they're just toxic all over the place, right? I mean, it's literally, it's, it's a problem being a man out there. You guys are the root of all evil. If you guys were to just lower your gaze, the world would be okay. Maybe I've been on Twitter too much. I don't know. <laughs> uh, so yeah, you know, I think some people may find some of these comments hostile from our sisters. But I think we really need to uh, be open to have these sort of dialogues. This is very important. Yes. Because yes. at the end of the day, this is our community. And if we want it to be successful in the future, then we really need to um, uh, discuss some of these elephants in the room and start talking about this stuff. Right? So we're not going to, uh, I, I appreciate the sisters actually, you know, expressing their um, uh, concern and things like that. So what I'm going to do is, I'm, I'll give one more question to the sister side, and then we'll give a couple more questions to the brothers. First of all, Jazakumal Khair, Jazakumal Alif Khair, Jamee'an, may Allah reward all of you guys for being patient with this. I mean, I mean. Um, I know this time that went on longer than we were supposed to go. So are there any sisters who actually want to ask a question uh, via microphone? Because I got text messages, I didn't get uh, anything else. Or maybe, do they, maybe some of them don't have the number? Perhaps they... Okay. You, you, want, to, you want to give out the numbers? I just say one. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't just give my phone number out, but... Oh. Um, <laughs> if, if they're going to ask a question, I'm open for this. But uh, first I'm going to give an uh, opportunity for them to ask a question. <laughs> 